Coming up on Tech News Weekly, is AI an abused buzzword in technology? It kind of seems like it might be. Also, everyday people are running phone farms in their houses, in their living rooms, and probably all over the house, basically. Uh, the community aspects of DEF CON, Black Hat, and B-Sides Las Vegas, and WeWork's S1 Filing has some curious insights into the business. That and more coming up next on Tech News Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Tech News Weekly, episode 95, recorded Thursday, August 15th, 2019. This episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Cashfly. Give your users the seamless online experience they want. Power your site or app with Cashfly's CDN and be 30% faster than the competition. Learn more at twit.cashfly.com. Hello and welcome to Tech News Weekly, the show where every week we talk to and about the people making and breaking the tech news. I am Micah Sargent. And I'm Jason Howell. I'm wearing pants, you're wearing shorts. You are the smarter one because it's like 95 degrees outside. It's, yeah. And you know, where I'm from, it's like 106 probably right now. Oh, but, so this is nothing for yeah, you. Psh, See, this is like crazy hot for me right now. I've, I've, I've become <laughs> a weather so wimp. It's so hot. There's no humidity. <laughs> it's wonderful. All right, all right. I'll take your word for that. All right, well, let's uh, get into things. As artificial intelligence and machine learning become less conceptual and all the more buzzwordy, we're seeing increased interest from venture firms looking to cash in on AI apps and services. But much like your beloved green television frog with a heart of gold, it turns out some of these AI apps and services are actually powered by humans. Parmi Olson from the Wall Street Journal is here to tell us all about it. Hello, Parmi. Hi, Micah. Oh, so good to have you here. We thank you uh, to, to be here to explain what's going on with AI and uh, investments. So one of the first things that you mentioned in the article um, is that non-experts have trouble discerning when AI is being deployed. So if we know that non-experts have those issues, are we seeing venture firms hire or bring in experts to vet AI? Or is the problem still kind of too new for those solutions to have taken place? Um, that's a great question. And I think that kind of talk speaks to the heart of the issue that we were exploring with this story, which was about a startup whose employees, current and past employees, uh, told us that it was exaggerating the, the extent of its AI capabilities. It, it had raised a lot of money from some very powerful and noteworthy investors, such as SoftBank and Lake Star Ventures and um, Jungle Ventures. Um, on the strength of its AI expertise. It claimed that it had human-assisted AI that could build app, apps as easily as ordering a pizza. Um, and it claimed that, uh, they said, rather, that they could automate the building of, of these apps. And uh, so your question about whether um, investors are able to, to vet this kind of technology, you know, that's actually not something we explore too deeply in the story, because one thing we can say is that startups that that use AI or categorize as being AI startups raise more money than typical software startups. Um, mm -hmm. They can justify those premiums in, to, to investors because AI experts that they hire are expensive and the computing power that they need to make this AI work is also expensive. Um, and so... And also, there's just it's such a hot industry. It's such a hot buzzword that um, the amount of money that's pouring into AI startups um, has also doubled uh, in 2018. Um, and so this is just there's so much um, investment going into this technology, not just from VCs. I mean, even governments are are putting hundreds of millions of dollars behind um, this type of technology. So speaking of buzzwords, one of the things that uh, is mentioned in the article is human-assisted AI, and that certainly feels kind of buzzwordy too. So you, you know, you're you're starting up a, a company, and you're like, okay, we kind of have some AI, but we want to 
make these companies or these investors really interested in this? Do you do you see human assist human assisted AI kind of taking off as a way that companies end up defining themselves, or is this the first kind of instance of that phrase, human assisted AI? Well, it's definitely something that I personally, as a tech reporter, um, seen elsewhere with other companies. It's o- often also referred to as human in the loop AI. Um, In this particular instance, it was referred to as human assisted AI. We spoke to a a number of venture capital investors and industry experts who said that it's actually fairly common for companies to, um, you know, talk up the extent of their technology capabilities. One reason they might do that is because they need humans to be gathering data to train these algorithms that will eventually replace them. Um, And so one AI expert that we spoke to said that he knew of companies that were using humans as a temporary stopgap before actually implementing the artificial intelligence that was going to replace them. So I suppose the question for the startup when it's marketing itself is, should it already kind of fake it till they make it? and say they've already got the AI when it's actually humans doing the work, or do they want to be um, upfront about the fact that humans are doing all the work currently, but down the line, maybe in a year and a two year, in two years, they will have trained up these algorithms that can replace those humans. With all these technologies, human assistance is required to a certain degree, obviously. So, I mean, then to that degree, like, Are the VCs, are they expecting too much or is this a a matter of expectations on the VCs uh, part of not, you know, making realistic expectations about how this technology is even developed in the first place? Well, I I can't speak for the VCs specifically, but one thing that a a venture capitalist did point out to me is that the amount of um, uh, new types of investors who are investing in uh, very cutting edge technology might have something to do with this phenomenon of companies who are able to raise money um, and who are perhaps to some extent um, exaggerating the extent of their capabilities. Um, There are, for example, corporate, uh, more corporate um, investment vehicles that are entering this space. Um, A venture capitalist I spoke to referred to non-sophisticated investors who are entering this sphere. Um, So in other words, kind of to kind of put that plainly, he was saying there's more people investing in technology who don't really understand this technology mm-hmm. and how to define it and what it what it does. So I think that's one issue. Um, and I think also artificial intelligence is so loosely defined and it, yeah. people define it as um, technology that learns you know, through machine learning. It can learn from being trained and from data or it can replicate things that humans can do, like translate languages or recognize a face or recognize a voice. Um, and so I think in the midst of all that mess, there's just so many opportunities for, um, you know, different parties to kind of take advantage of that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, one of the questions that, that I had as well. So we know that kind of the uh, big benefit that it seems to be for investors is, is cutting costs with AI. So if you have an artificial intelligence that can do things that humans would do, you only kind of have to uh, pay for the upkeep of the AI after it's put together, you know, until it becomes sentient and starts asking you for more money. But until that point, it kind of uh, takes care of itself. My question is, are there any other benefits that um, investors have talked about that they see other than just the idea of cutting costs? Like, is that the one thing that drives so many people right now into wanting to invest in companies that have .ai at the end of their domain? Well, that's apt. I think that is the number one reason is the cost cutting reason. So, for example, we were just reporting a few weeks ago on supermarkets who want to start using image recognition in their surveillance cameras so that they can, in the same way that Amazon Go does, um, track what people are taking off the shelves. And in other words, down the line, they don't have to pay for human cashiers as much. anyway. So that's AI leading to cost savings. Um, but the other benefit to answer your question, I suppose, would also be Um, better targeting consumers. So if you think about the extremely smart algorithms that underpin uh, Google's search technology or the Facebook news feed, a lot of that is driven by machine learning and 
very smart artificial intelligence algorithms. Um, and I think that's that's part of the, the value benefit as well. But I think for now, in terms of why people invest in this, it's for saving money. Gotcha. Well, we want to thank you so much for joining us, Parmi Olson. Uh, if people are looking to get in touch online, where can they follow you? Where can they find your work? Um, so you can find my work on the Wall Street Journal dot com. Um, and I'm on Twitter at Parmy, P-A-R-M-Y. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Parmy. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking with you. All right. Up next, mom and pop phone farms are apparently a thing. And I had no idea about this. Yeah. First I heard of it. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that and a whole lot more coming up next. Uh, but this episode of Tech News Weekly is brought to you by Cashfly. So you can give your users the seamless online experience that they want. Cashfly is going to make that possible. You power your site or your app with Cashfly's CDN, and you'll be 30% faster than the competition. No matter what industry your business is in, if your website is directly tied to company revenue, you can give your customers the fast downloads that they need, that they expect with Cashfly. Cashfly CDN delivers rich media content up to 10 times faster than traditional delivery methods and up to 30% faster than the major uh, other CDNs out there. Backed by a 100% SLA, Cashfly guarantees the best user experience for all your customers, no matter where they are or what device they happen to be on. So you can join the thousands of others who trust Cashfly's reliable network, including LG, Microsoft, Adobe, Ars Technica, of course, Twit. As Leo's been saying for a long, for quite a long time, Twit simply wouldn't exist without Cashfly. We've been hosting all our podcasts, our audio, our video on Cashfly for nearly a decade. Uh, monthly views and listens, uh, talking petabytes of data downloaded fast and flawlessly. So say goodbye to logging in multiple times a week, or even worse, daily trying to track your CDN usage. You won't get billing spikes. You'll get a custom plan tailored to your CDN needs based on yearly usage trends. And on average, customers who switch to Cashfly save more than 20%. You can imagine what you could do with that 20% and your time. Just for Twit listeners, Cashfly is giving away a complimentary detailed analysis of your current CDN bill and usage trends. You can see if you happen to be overpaying 20% or more for your CDN. Learn more by going to twit.cashfly.com and check it out for yourself. That's twit.cashfly.com. We thank Cashfly for their support. So have you ever heard of a DIY phone farm before? DIY? No, that's, I, that's bananas. Yeah. it's. Uh, I mean, I'd heard of phone farms, but I didn't know that people were just like springing these up in their homes. Uh, I hadn't read about it until an article on Motherboard talking about how everyday Americans are using them to make money online. The author of the piece, of course, Joseph Cox, uh, is here to tell us about this well, I think I think you could call this a fraud scheme, right, Joseph? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely some sort of fraud. Uh, the ad fraud ecosystem is pretty large, yeah. and this is, of course, a small part of it. Um, but they, they are tricking companies into giving them some sort of funds. So, yeah, in a way, it is fraud, yeah. So phone farms are not new. Um, you, you talk in the piece about how you know there, there are operations in places like China that are springing up phone farms for a number of reasons. Why do they exist? What is the goal of their operations? Yeah, so every few months you'll see a video on Twitter or YouTube or something go viral. And it'll be of this Chinese or uh, in Thailand, a phone farm. And it will be these dozens, if not hundreds of phones all lined up doing various things. Sometimes there are people um, tapping on them physically or sometimes they're sort of run by automation software. As far as I understand, the ones overseas are particularly used for, okay, I have an app and now I want to get it higher up in the App Store ratings on the Google Play Store or something like that. So they can look like, oh, a load of people have reviewed this app and it's really, really popular. Uh, and maybe they also sell likes or engagement on Instagram, that sort of thing. Um, with the Americans, it's a little bit different. They're not so much selling a service as the Chinese ones. You'll go and say, hey, I want to improve my app. Please, could you do that? The American DIY phone farms are doing more ad fraud. So they will download an app onto their phone. And the way the app usually works is like, hey, if you watch this Netflix trailer and you basically give us your attention, we will then uh, trade that for some you know, digital currency. It'll be uh, little points to use in the app or something like that. And you, if you get enough of them, you can trade that for, uh, until recently, real money uh, or Amazon gift cards or something like that. Um, 
of course, these phone farmers, they aren't really actually watching those adverts. They're mm-hmm. also buying dozens or around 100 phones uh, and streaming all of that content at the same time. So they're, whereas the Chinese are focused on the social media manipulation stuff, the Americans are more on, well, I'm going to get some extra income for myself, basically. And that's how people were using them. And they're incentivized through the app. The app, the app is kind of their conduit running on this phone to visit the site witness the ad or, you know, technically witness the ad. And mm-hmm. then the developer of the app then passes the, what, the, the money that they're, they're making through these views onto the phone farmers? Is that how it works? Yeah. So it, it's probably worth just defining it there. I mean, use the word um, incentivize, and that's exactly it. There's a, a model or, a, I guess, a technique in marketing called incentivize traffic, whereas usually you watch an advert or you see an advert in your web browser. That's just um, normal. You don't get paid for that, right? Um, just hopefully you'll go buy their product. In incentivized marketing, it flips that on its head, and it is the consumer of the advert who is getting a little bit of money or currency or whatever. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of just flipping that idea around and then taking as much advantage of it as possible with these phone farms. So then they're looking for specific apps that offer this incentivized traffic as opposed to, you know, I go and download what phone farm, which is an app where you build your own farm say, and in Mm -hmm. that app I can collect crystals that then help me play the game. These are apps where you download it. And if you watch the ads in it, then at some point you can cash in your hours watched for an Amazon gift card or something like that. Correct? Yeah, 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 exactly. So these are dedicated apps, as you say, to this incentivized marketing Mm -hmm. um, model. And those are perfectly legitimate. Um, Some advertising experts I uh, spoke to said that the idea of incentivized traffic, some clients want that. Um, one app in particular is very closely linked to sort of the cryptocurrency space. And apparently they see some sort of value in, well, if we give our adverts in this way to people, maybe we're going to get a higher rate of return. Um, and that's perfectly fine and legitimate. And people, of course, can do that. It's when someone starts using dozens or hundreds of phones to sort of defraud that approach. Wow. So then um, how how like hands on do people have to be like I, I, I kind of envision them having a number of phones, which, you know, they had to fund the investment of buying those phones to begin with. How hands on do they have to be once these things are running and how lucrative can it be? I mean, so the promise is that it's not really hands-on at all. You would imagine that they buy these phones, they set them up, and oh, wow, I get this passive income. And it can be that sometimes it just really depends on the app because they're constantly changing. Some will uh, block um, if you have too many devices. Some will lose their ad network customers because they don't want to be affiliated with phone farms. And sometimes the apps in our tests, because I also built a very small phone farm of just four separate phones, they're just very buggy. And they're not great pieces of software. So they will quite often, in my case, crash and I have to go and reboot them and sometimes reboot the entire Android device. Uh, If you're working from home or one person I spoke to um, was disabled at the time and they were unable to leave the house, it was okay for them because, you know, they were constantly around and they could reset the devices and all that sort of thing. Um, But it's not as hands-off as you may imagine. Yeah, it's actually quite a bit of work, rather ironically, because the entire point is to get money without working. Yeah. But you do have to put in some effort, in my experience, yeah. Wow. I, I mean, so then is it legal? <laughs> I, can't, I can't tell. It so doesn't sound like it the, should be legal, but... <laughs> right, right. The, the legality bit is a, a little bit difficult. I mean, yeah. what you could say, certainly, is that it's going to be a terms of service violation. Um, right, you know, right. if you... If you're doing something like scraping LinkedIn, for instance, that's a terms of fer- a terms of service violation. You're probably not going to get prosecuted, uh, but LinkedIn will ban you. In a similar case with the phone farms, the apps will ban you, um, probably. But I can't see them pursuing charges. And this, yeah. ju- it, it's important to remember. It's just it's not on the scale it is in China. Like sure. uh, the the the, per- the person I spoke to who made the most was making. a month, which is a sizable amount of money. uh, But that was only for, I think, a year, maybe less than a year they were making that. Some of these people are making literally 40 bucks a month, which they then use to buy food or diapers for their kids. Right. So I don't immediately see charges being brought. But the legality is sort of unclear. It depends if you then turn that into real fiat currency. If there was going to be a legal issue, I imagine it would be at that point. Yeah. 
Now, with this, with the incentivized traffic specifically, again, these apps that they download for the I watch and I get, are the the developer on the other end that you know has put this app in the app store, are they also making money off of the views? Or is it, I've chosen to serve ads in this app and in doing so, only the person watching gets money or do both parties in that case get money from, from serving these ads? So I'm not entirely sure on the specifics of each individual app, but very generally speaking, yes, the developers of the apps are still going to get money because I believe they are going to be um, getting funds or other benefits or other arrangements from sort of the ad networks themselves. These apps aren't, um, you know, designing the adverts, of course, they're not um, creating them, they are delivering them. But in a uh, in a more traditional ad environment, when you go and you, you're on a website and you see um, an ad pop up, there is an ad network that has delivered that. Uh, it's another part of the ecosystem. So the apps here will be getting some sort of um, financial incentive as well themselves. I mean, they're not doing this um, for free. Oh, yeah, the kindness of their heart. <laughs> so then perhaps, <laughs> right, exactly. perhaps there's even more of a reason not to go after these folks that are, are, you know, gaming the system by making the 40 bucks, the 50 bucks a month, because both parties are benefiting from it. Do, do you see that as a, uh, a reason maybe that these apps have decided, okay, well, we're not going to pursue the person that's made their DIY phone farm because the app developer is making money and the person at the other end is making money. So it's kind of mutually beneficial in a way. Is, is that a factor in this or does it end up being where if they had the opportunity, they would still pursue the person who's downloaded the app? Yeah, so there's definitely a dynamic between one half of the phone uh, phone farmers I spoke to who kind of just play by the book. They'll only run, you know, multiple phones, but they won't really do anything extra shady. Then there's another half which will use software to trick the phone into thinking there's a human pushing the buttons and they will use VPNs and they will route their traffic for various places. And that gets a lot more gray, a lot more quickly. Um, people in the former half, the ones who kind of want to play by the books and not annoy anybody, they made that exact point you just made is like, well, there's a mutually uh, beneficial relationship here. We don't want to screw over the companies, the app developers, because then they may screw us, screw us over as well. At the moment, everybody's winning. Uh, but then, of course, other people do go ahead and try to further manipulate the system and they'll get banned and then maybe the app developers will get annoyed and they'll lose the ad networks and that sort of thing. So, yeah, there is that tension, uh, but some people just go ahead and abuse it anyway. Now, you also wrote, um, you've wrote a bunch of really great articles over the last couple of weeks, so it was hard to pick Thanks. one, but uh, you wrote about the iPhone uh, lightning cables that look like the real deal, but actually give hackers a way to tap into your computer, which is absolutely not what you want when you're plugging a lightning uh. cable into your computer. Um, is this, the, and, and I guess this was revealed at, at DEF CON and a bunch of these were handed out and everything. Um, is this the kind of thing that people should be actively concerned about finding these on listings like Amazon or whatever when they're buying lightning cables or what should people know about this? So yeah, this cable, um, the researcher known as MG, he gave me a demo and you plug it in and it basically looks like a lightning cable, but it acts like a keyboard and mouse. So if your Mac can accept new keyboards, as most do, um, they'll plug it in and he can run commands on it remotely, uh, depending on certain factors of what range is in. As for whether people need to worry about it, we haven't seen any evidence of it being on Amazon or eBay yet, but it does highlight... Um, that hardware supply chain is um, is a serious risk. And that sort of issue is trickling down. Of course, implants in Mac cables or USB cables, this is the stuff that intelligence agencies have been doing for years and years and years. Uh, we saw that in some of the NSA disclosures a while ago as well. But it's now that for $200, which sure is quite expensive for a piece of hacking gear yeah. but of course within the um it's within the price range of a lot more people than the nsa right um as that trickles down even further it may be something you need to um worry about i don't know immediately if you know if you saw one on amazon and you bought it would they be able to hack you um not necessarily they still sometimes have to be within wi-fi range of the laptop it really depends but one example we had where people were buying Bitcoin hardware wallets on places like Amazon and eBay, somewhere, you know, a physical device you could store your uh, Bitcoin on. And they were maliciously altered 
so the person could then just steal your Bitcoin later on. That's an, that's an example of supply chain attack that people are seeing in the wild and relatively, you know, normal low level targets, you know, not terrorists or anything like that. So not at the moment, but potentially in the future, sure. And hardware supply, and cha- supply chain attacks is just something that we do need to keep in the back of our minds. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, Joseph Cox, uh, vice.com. Thanks so much for hopping on. And uh, everybody should definitely follow your work because, like I said, you are prolific. You write a lot of really great stuff. Where can people follow you online if they want to find you? Uh, my Twitter is at Joseph F. Cox, and that's the best place um, to follow my work, really. Awesome. Thank you, Joseph. Thank Appreciate you your time. Thank you. We'll Cheers. Appreciate you it. So we talked a little bit about it uh, in, the, in that interview, but if you didn't know, the past week in Las Vegas was full of insecurity, <laughs> namely DEF CON, Black Hat, uh, B-Sides Las Vegas. There were three big events that brought the InfoSec community out to learn, to demonstrate, to explore, all together a hacker summer camp of sorts. Joining us to talk about some of the more interesting threads from all of these events is Karen Elizari, founder of B-Sides uh, TLV. Welcome to the show, Karen. Hi, great to be on the show. I'm the founder of B-Sites Tel Aviv here in Israel. I'm glad to talk to you about Hacker Summer Camp and all of the crazy shenanigans that took place there. Yeah, absolutely. You've been busy, uh, I imagine, you know, not, not just with your event, but also with everything else happening this past week. Why don't we start, though, with the event that you run, B-Sides Tel Aviv. Uh, talk a little bit about B the B-Sides community and the work that you do with B-Sides Tel Aviv. Happy to. So the B-Sides community started 10 years ago, basically with a group of hackers and security researchers that didn't feel like they found their place and their voice inside that crazy week that's called Black Hat Conference and the DEF CON, DEF CON Conference. Basically, they felt that these events were becoming very big, somewhat commercial, and that there was space for opening up a platform for the individual hackers and researchers. I started B-Sides Tel Aviv about five years ago as part of that global B-Sides community. And basically the idea is to create that alternative, that B-Side, just like the B-Side of the vinyl record or mm -hmm. the B-Side of the tape, depending yeah. on your generational choices of music. <laughs> both, both work but for me. The, the idea... Yeah. Yeah, the idea was really to create that alternative space. Our community here in Tel Aviv has brought together thousands of hackers. Today, it's the largest hacker event that we have in Israel. And it, we're very proud to be part of the global security B-Sides movement. And in fact, last week in Las Vegas was B-Sides Las Vegas number 10. And B-Sides Las Vegas was the very first, the original um, the or event that catalyzed this entire movement, really. And it brought thousands of people together. And it's always the case that with the B-Sides event, you can expect more of the community atmosphere. You can expect people that are bringing their family with them to the conference. You can expect first-time speakers. You can expect an underground track where talks are never going to be recorded or filmed or quoted. So there is a lot of that old school grassroots hacker community vibe that's still alive and well and taking place in the B-Sides atmosphere. And I felt uh, there, you know, I gave a talk there as well. I've, I always feel like the B-Sides events are where people can really connect with the heart and soul of the friendly hacker community. Yeah, I think community being the big word uh, among all these events, right? Like these events are perfect for bringing together everyone who has a shared interest in a specific thing. And it just so happens that Vegas is like the perfect place this particular week because there's so many of these community uh, events happening. So everyone, uh, you know, everyone who's there is talking the same language, essentially. What what exactly would you say are, are a few of the highlights from your event uh, just just a few days ago, a few weeks ago? So, so for me personally, the highlights were just seeing the incredible diversity of the people mm -hmm. in participation throughout these events at B-Side, at Black Hat, at DEF CON. The fact is that during this week, you can have specific events that are tailored for the sub-communities within our global hacker community. And the fact that you can have something like QueerCon for the queer and LGBTQA community, and you can also have something called ShabbatCon 
for the Jewish Orthodox Shabbat observing hacker community. And both of these things can take place at the same time and be respectful of one another. And the people can have a, the, we still have a common language as security researchers, but we still have our own spaces. And you could participate in events uh, looking specifically, what was really fascinating to me was the many villages. So this year, DEF CON had a, just an incredible diversity of technical aspects to look at in areas that were dedicated to specific areas. These were called villages. And within those villages, you had things like the biohacking village where people were getting implanted with RFID chips and learning about mm -hmm. hacking into insulin pumps and pacemakers and hospital systems. But you also had the voting machine hacking village where people actually had an opportunity to look at the different voting machines that are being used across the states. And not just hackers were there, there was actually a congressional delegation. There were actually representatives of state level and federal level government agencies that were there to learn about what the hackers can show them is possible with these voting technologies that are going to all you know, influence or take some, some part in the 2020 elections in the United States. Another fantastic event was the car hacking village and uh, one of the prizes in the car hacking village was a Tesla. And as they called it, slightly pre-owned Tesla, because <laughs> the Tesla was actually standing there in the car hacking village throughout the weekend. And people that were, you know, getting um, getting ahead or doing very well in the capture the flag, the CTF, CTF competition, also got the opportunity to use a sledgehammer on the Tesla. What? And that definitely created, yes, that definitely created quite a, a big excitement. People are standing in line waiting to get on well, that Tesla. That's a unique. And, uh, maybe, Why would you do that? Yeah, that's, Don't do that. That's very unique. <laughs> well, you know, part of the fun of hacking is breaking things. Yeah, that's and true. And that's where... <laughs> That's where I feel like these events are really important, is that we have these events, we have these opportunities to get together and safely break things, learn together how to break things so that we can make them better. And that's certainly something that, from my point of view, defines the hacker community and what it's all about. It's about breaking the boundaries so that we can create something better. It's about demonstrating a threat so that we can spark a solution in the words of the legendary hacker Barnaby Jack, who was perhaps one of the first to demonstrate attacks on ATM machines and uh, insulin pumps. He brought those types of demonstrations to the hacker community and made that more popular. So it was great fun, certainly. And there was um, a lot of excitement amongst the community with these specific villages that were taking place. Yeah, no kidding. The The election stuff, obviously, is really top of mind uh, because we've, we've just been hearing so much about this. Like... How, how exactly does that influence the 2020 elections? You got all these people like trying to hack these, uh, these election systems. I'm sure they learned a lot. That then feeds right into like, like are the companies that, that create this equipment offering it and they say, okay, yay, now we know what's, what's insecure here. Or are people you know, bringing in all these election systems that they've accessed on their own? And how does that make its way back into kind of the overall system? That's a great question, Jason. So one aspect was that, in fact, for the uh, voting machine hacking village, some of these machines, as you know, each state in the United States uses a variety of different machines. And in fact, across the nation, there are perhaps hundreds of different types of devices that are being used in federal and state level elections. So some of these machines were simply acquired off of eBay or donated by anonymous donors. So they weren't necessarily brought there by the companies that make these devices. But it was imperative, and it is indeed critical from my point of view, that those organizations do send representatives there. And the fact was that congressional delegates and other state level officials were there to take a look. In some of the other villages, like for example, the biohacking village, I think they represent a great example of working together with the device makers. So companies that actually make these critical healthcare systems actually brought their own equipment and were there to directly interact and engage with the hackers. In a similar fashion, the aviation village, which I thought was fascinating. For the first time, we had an aviation village. Personally, I got to wear um, a fighter jet helmet, see what it's like inside a fighter jet helmet. Nice. There was an F-35 simulator. Uh, they had actually a small airport made out of I guess, Lego and other kind of uh, Playmobil parts and people could actually experiment and what it would mean if they were changing some of the systems 
on the landing strip, how it would change consequences for that landing strip. There were representatives from the Air Force. So I think it's remarkable that certain organizations, like, for example, in the aviation village, that you have organizations like uh, the Air Force and other companies, and in the biohacking village, you have medical device companies, are directly coming to hacker summer camp to interact with hackers. And the fact that congressional delegates were there, I mean, I I imagine that for some of them, it must have seemed like a, you know, a wild journey into the unknown, but hopefully it was a very educational journey. And certainly I know from my point of view that the friendly hackers were there, very happy to welcome these types of delegations. Was the sledgehammer involved in all in the uh, bio portion or the aviation portion? (laughs) So the sledgehammer was quite specific to the Tesla. I do have to point that out. I also have to say Tesla as a company has been coming out to Hacker Summer Camp for quite a few years. In fact, last summer, I saw Elon Musk come there in person for an event that wasn't publicized, but he was there in person to meet with some of the hackers that his company wishes to interact with and to hire. And not just for Tesla, also for SpaceX, by the way. So there are those forward thinking organizations that are putting the hacker summer camp and the Las Vegas, you know, summer conferences on their map and on their radar. I can tell you that at the biohacking village, one of the key activities was the uh, voluntary implantation of RFID chips oh boy. done by a one, one friendly hacker doctor, Johnny Christmas. Hashtag not a doctor. But still, a lot of people enjoyed uh, enjoyed that. And, you know, people are learning how to experiment with technology. And that's what being a hacker is all about. Yeah. Like I envision uh, a bio, from, from what you're talking about, this this biohacking village and like stopping in to get an implant. It just reminds me of like a tattoo parlor. But instead yeah. of like setting up an appointment to get a tattoo, you're setting up an appointment to get a chip implanted in your body. I would like a new hand. Well, people- yeah, right. People certainly got tattoos in Vegas. People yeah. also got their hair cut. So they got mohawks. So a long-term tradition of DEF CON is actually a competition. First of all, there's a competition for beards. I didn't participate in that. (laughs) But there's also an event where people can uh, get a mohawk and donate the money for charity. And I believe the Electronic Frontier Foundation collects that money. And so lots of people walk around with mohawks, which they got on the conference floor, Mm -hmm. and they donated the money that they paid for the mohawk artist. They donated that money to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So, in fact, this event might seem very scary when we learn about all of the hacks and the exploits and, you know, the threats that are looming. But it's really important to remember the community aspect. And the fact is that people come together, they donate their time, their attention, their willingness to research on technology, all in order to really make people safer. So even though hackers may seem scary, I find it to be a really fascinating and fun event. Well, and that's obvious. You have a lot of energy and passion about this. And uh, yeah, I love hearing about the community of, the, of these three events kind of all coming together. Everyone shared interest. Everybody learning, right? Like, I think I think the the perception for people who are unaware is to look at these and be like, oh, it's just a bunch of hackers getting together to figure out how they can, you know, undo the world and break everything. And while there's there's truth to that. I think I think the other side of that is they're they're figuring out how to break these things to make them better. The overall you know goal is to lift lift things up and make them less penetrable, like make them safer. And uh, it's just a cool community aspect that you're talking about. So it is. I love hearing you talk about it. It's absolutely a friendly community and it's all about demonstrating a threat so that we can spark a a solution. And I think that's what we in the hacker community believe in. Personally, I like to talk about the hacker immune system, how hackers are acting as an immune system of sorts to Mm. help us identify all of these problems in our world. And I couldn't be more excited about it. That's a great way to put it. Karen Elizari, uh, you have a TED Talk. Everyone should definitely check it out called uh, Hackers the Internet's Immune System, exactly what you were talking about. Right, yes. uh, And you contributed to the book, Women in Tech. Karen, it's, so, it's such a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much for hopping on with us today. Where, um, Thanks. Where can people follow you online if they want to follow your work? So I can be found online. On Twitter, I am Karen E. All of the E's are spelled with three. So that's K, three, R, three, and three. Karen E, all of the E's are spelled with three. You can also find me on my website. I have a ton of content on YouTube. I've got, of course, my TED 2014 talk, Hackers are the Immune System of the Internet. And you can certainly find me in B-Sides Tel Aviv, right here in beautiful Israel, where we welcome hackers of all shapes and sizes. Right on, Karen. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful uh, evening. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Sayonara. All right, take care.
WeWork, the company whose mission apparently is to elevate the world's consciousness, okay. rents out office space. It also recently filed its S-1 and the associated disclosures. Alex Wilhelm of Crunchbase is here to walk us through all the details. Hello, Alex. Hey, everybody. How's it going? It's going well. How are you? Well, you know what? It's not quite Friday. It's still Thursday, but we're dang close to the weekend. And I don't think any more companies can possibly go public. So I'm hoping to get some sleep tonight, if I'm being totally honest. (laughs) That's not going to (laughs) happen. We'll see. Uh, But speaking of this company uh, going public, so I've read some articles and seen some conversations about the abnormality uh, of this S1. So I would just like to ask you, what is it that has people talking about this filing that makes it different from maybe some other companies in this space? Yeah, it's a really good question. So one thing you get used to when you read a lot of these filings is you see a pattern to things. There's a way people talk about the revenue, talk about their cost of revenue, gross margins, other kind of financial terms. WeWork had a very complex filing. It was it was hard to parse, even as someone who knows how to read these. And my impression is that companies that are trying to either hide or kind of paper over some things to use more complex reporting and a more complex method of discussing how they've done. And so in this case, reading through what we were kind of put out, I, I can see how a lot of people might get lost very quickly. The company, for example, didn't report a cost of revenue. So it was hard to calculate its gross margins, a very standard business metric. And this got more and more arcane based on how you handle leases, certain real estate costs, ownership structures, where they lease their trademark, how they lend money to the CEO, which I think we're going to get to, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so to me, this is a company that had too much freedom when it was private to do whatever it wanted. And this is the result of it. Kind of a big mess. <laughs> kind of a big mess. Yeah, I, that seems to be the theme that I'm, I'm getting. And um, I know, Jason, you kind of had some some more specific questions about uh, what the interviews that have taken place, the way that the company's set up right now. Well, yeah. So there were there were a couple of interviews that actually um, were called out in the S1 filing uh, interviews with Adam Newman uh, gave to Business Insider and Axios. This was just in May. Um, why exactly are they being called out? It sounds like maybe maybe he may have said too much at that point, or what's going on there? So there's a, a period of time called the quiet period in which yeah. when you're going public, you're not supposed to talk to the media. Now, this is pretty ironclad, and a lot of people will say, I can't talk right now. We're in a quiet period. I can talk to you later. Uh, It's set up to prevent disclosures to certain parties ahead of large events that could have financial impact on shareholders or the public itself. It's a pretty good reasonable safeguard we have in our capitalist system to keep things fair. In this case, the CEO spoke to, I believe, two publications, Axios and BI, and they said in their S1 that they don't think they violated Section 5 of the SEC's whatever, 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 and they would vigorously fight any claim otherwise. But it's a really glaring admission to have to say, oh, by the way, just 25 minutes ago, we had such poor controls in our executives that we did a bunch of interviews that could get us in trouble, by the way, invest in our company. It's embarrassing. It's an unforced error. And it just goes to show that the company is not quite as mature as you would expect from a firm that is putatively valued at $47 billion. This is amateur hour stuff. <laughs> and have they commented on, at all on this uh, since since the filing, or as, at least as far as you've heard? Well, now they're in the quiet period. So oh, so, oh I, I see, I see. Going to, they're going to obey it this time. But my impression is that this uh, note is what we're going to get. This is what they've told us. Oh, I got you. And I, I got it, you. it's unclear if they will get in trouble, but just the, the optics of it are very, very bad. And optics do matter. So. Yeah. Yes, certainly do. And so this is, like you said, this is a, a matter of a company and its its team kind of being, its, its leading team, its CEO being separate entities and maybe not having that control. So is it my understanding that we've got sort of WeWork and their financial people doing one thing to make this company go, company go public while we just have an out of control? Like what is the, the sort of... Um, drama slash soap opera breakdown of, of how this all works <laughs> where like how come the ceo is having these interviews how does that happen how how are they not seems in like a little bit of a loose cannon of sorts yeah exactly yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question. And it comes down to voting power. 
One thing that we've seen happen in the last five, six years of kind of the unicorn era, as we call it in the financial technology space, is that founders often maintain voting control of their companies much longer than they used to. In fact, it's not super rare today to see companies go public and have the founders still own a majority, sorry, control a majority of the votes. And that means you really can't tell them anything. And if I recall the WeWork S1, all you know, 20 billion pages of it, there is a point where it says after the IPO, Adam Newman will maintain voting control of the company. And that means he can kind of do what he wants. There's not a lot of controls on him. And this is where you get the drama that you just mentioned and the problems that you mentioned, because how do you control someone who you can't really vote out of office? Uh, and, and, you know, it, it is a facet of 2019 and the current kind of startup climate that we're in. But this is a, an egregious example of how things can get uh, sticky for no reason because there's no effective uh, leash or controls on the on the leadership team that runs the day-to-day operations uh, of the business. Does that make sense, guys? Am I talking sense? You are talking perfect sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. One thing that I'm really curious about, I mean, uh, along in the kind of the the growing list of, of things that are just kind of strange about all this, uh, Newman cashed out around $700 million prior to the IPO. I would imagine, I mean, maybe I don't understand it as, as well. As, well, I definitely don't understand <laughs> as well as you do, but tell me why, why, uh, someone in his position would want to do that. Wouldn't you want to hold on to those and have all the faith in the world that the IPO is going to go well and those that's actually going to be worth way more uh, post-IPO than it is cashing it out now? Why would he want to do that? That is the traditionally correct way to think about this. You're dead on. And it used to be called aligned incentives. You didn't want to see founders or executives cashing out their stock ahead of an IPO in any way because that would take away their interest in the company's success at that liquidity event, the IPO, that would reward all shareholders, employees, investors, and founders. Now, though, there's a kind of a different feeling about this sort of transaction in the startup world. It's kind of okay now for some founders to take some money off the table, and people don't really look at it too negatively. The reason is it lowers implied dilution on future equity rounds. That's a bit technical, but what matters is it's kind of okay. What's mm. not okay is $700 million. Now, this wasn't him just selling stock. This was him borrowing money against some stock, selling some stock. It was kind of a hybrid of transactions over time. But what it looks like, as you just said, is the CEO cashing out ahead of an IPO because he's concerned about the financial prospects of his company. Um, it's just, again, an unforced error that's, that's founded on this lack of control and lack of, I think, maturity at the business. They thought they were untouchable and they did this. And they also lent the CEO money to buy buildings that he then leased back to the business. That's super unethical, I think. <laughs> no, um, I but they did it and then they got, they got, it was reported and then they kind of undid it. But there's just a lot of stuff like that around in this document. And I, it, it's a, it's a shame because there's a lot about we work to like. Uh, but I think the conversation going over the IPO is going to be this and then the financial side of things, which is a bit messy as well. Um, it, it could have just been done better. But at the same time, I haven't built a company worth billions of dollars. So I'm just talking from the sidelines. And I should point that out you know, this far into me in my diatribe. Yet. You haven't built that company yeah, yet. Exactly. So yeah. I have a feeling it's going to have something to do with poodles. Uh, <laughs> you wrote in your article, at the end of 2018, WeWork had $1.74 in cash and equivalents. That figure rose to $2.47 billion by the end of Q2 2019. Recall that WeWork raised $1 billion earlier this year. So where did the extra money go? WeWork burned it. My question for yes. you, uh, is WeWork's cash burn rate sustainable? And if it's not sustainable, how do you think the company's going to go about putting out that cash fire if it needs to? Yeah. Okay. So to put that in perspective, I have some numbers here in my little note stock. So in 2018, they had negative investing cash flow of $2.48 billion, if I can read my handwriting. In the first <laughs> half of 2019 alone, that number was $2.36 billion. Now, a lot of companies raise capital. They spend it to kind of build out their network, or in this case, their physical footprint. And it's a way for us to look at their, um, their cash expenses in a non-operating basis. It's kind of a distinct bucket of money. But what matters is that's still real money that they're spending. And so WeWork is going to do a kind of a hybrid IPO. They're going to raise a bunch of money through debt. At the same time, they're going to raise a bunch of money by selling equity in their offering. The goal there is to raise more total capital for their business operations without having to sell that many shares. So, Micah, your question is really good because the answer is kind of. They can kind of keep this up for maybe another year. But at that point, they're not going to have 
uh, enough money left to fund it, even after a debt offering and after an IPO. And at that point, they're going to have to reduce their cash burn and then probably slow up their growth rate. And at that point, Wall Street will care more about profits than growth. So the company's leash here or time period they have to try to change their model and their financial underpinnings isn't particularly long if they keep spending as they currently are. Now, they may not. I'm not in charge of WeWork. I don't know. But they're a growth story and growth oriented businesses tend to spend a lot of money. So in the short term, if their debt offering goes well and the IPO goes off as planned, they'll have capital, but certainly they can't do this for more than another 18, 24 months at the most. All right. Well, we'll be uh, staying tuned for that next 18 to 24 months. Uh, I want to thank you so much for joining us, Alex Wilhelm. Uh, Of course, we can find your work over on Crunchbase, but where can people follow you online? I am on Twitter, twitter.com slash Alex. And if I have my dates correct, you can see me on This Week in Tech, August 25th. I'll be in the studio. So I'll see everyone then. Right All on. Right. Awesome. We're looking, looking forward, forward to, to seeing it. you. Bye, right, guys. Thanks for having me. Good talking with you, Alex. Take care. All right, that's it. Uh, no stories of the week this time because we were blessed with four awesome Ooh. interviews. So that's what that's what happens when suddenly everyone says yes. And you're like, yeah, all right. So it all worked out for us this time. Tech News Weekly records live every Thursday starting at 11 a.m. Pacific at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us at tnw at twit.tv. You can also subscribe to our show at twit.tv slash TNW. Follow us on the socials. That's Twitter. That's Instagram. That's whatever the next social media stream is. TikTok. We Are we on TikTok yet? We're not, but oh. we better get there. Yeah. And you know what? You looking at me there at the end of the show just reminded me that you yeah. promised me whiskey this time, and that didn't happen. Oh, I've got it in the office. Oh, okay. We're good. It's We're good, cool. folks. <laughs> if you want to tweet at me about your favorite whiskey or poodles... You can tweet at Micah Sargent. <laughs> and if you want pictures of us drinking uh, booze, uh, I'll post it at <laughs> Jason Howell. Sure, sure. Actually, uh, yes, a fan of the show, Bleak, sent a, sent a bottle of, of bourbon probably like a month and a half ago. So I've got it at my desk. So no way. You can, you can have a, a little bit of that, sure. A very uh, small amount. Yeah, just a tiny little bit, the smallest glass ever. Uh, thanks to everyone who helps us do this show each and every week. John, Jeff, John, Colleen. And thanks to you, because you watch the show and listen to the show each and every week, and we appreciate you. We'll see you next week on Tech News Weekly. Bye, everybody. Goodbye.